Right, we move now, we move on, we continue naturally with VR. So when I say v, the, the word VR, I'm sure, I'm sure many of you, the first thing maybe that comes to mind is gaming, the gaming industry. But the thing is, VR is so much more than that. It's almost like an iceberg, and uh, the gaming, gaming industry is at the top, and there's so much more we, we can actually delve into and actually use that in a way that will, can really benefit not just us, but, but society as a whole. And the next gentleman on stage is going to share with you his insights, the trends, what's happening now, making sense of the landscape right now and also in the future as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our next uh, next speaker talking about the next mass medium naturally of VR. Please welcome product head for Vive Europe HTC, Mr. Graham Breen. Fantastic, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. And thanks for having me here, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about Vive. Vive is premium VR. Before I do this, I just want to get a feel for who's in here, um, what you guys know about VR, what you don't know. So I'm assuming, has everybody in here tried VR? Has anyone not tried VR? Great. Has everyone tried Sony PlayStation VR? Oculus? Vive? None of those three? Cool. So we're talking to a pretty educated audience. At least you've got a feel for what good VR can feel like. So I'm going to talk to you about some of our learnings with Vive so far. Before I do that, it's maybe worth introducing myself. So I'm, I guess you'd call me the first European employee in terms of Vive. I was in HTC beforehand. And I picked this thing up as a dev project. And it was a bunch of cables on a floor. And it was something very exciting. And the second I tried it, it changed my career forever. Um, and it's become an obsession. Um, we've lived around it now for a few years. We very first showed it to the media two years ago. Um, and it was quite an impact because we showed it to a small select group of tech journalists. When one of them took the headset off, he began crying. He was that emotional. So we knew we had something special. And Vive's been out there now for a year. And so actually, consumers today have Vive. And Vive stands for a lot more than just a VR headset. So actually, Vive is a few things. Vive is the VR headset, the HTC Vive. But it's also something called Viveport, which is our marketplace. Marketplace for all non-gaming content. And I'm going to come on to the gaming, non-gaming split in a minute. We're also supporting something called Vive Studios. We're creating content. And something called ViveX. There's so many ideas coming out these days, um, so many great ideas. And we don't have them all. But we're running an accelerator program supporting startup companies with VIVEX. So I'm going to talk about that a little as well. So VR for us feels like the next logical step in Medium, the next major computing platform. So we've gone from the PC into web, into mobile. And VR really is that next thing. And it's because it takes you that step further. It takes you to the next degree of immersiveness. And it allows you to interact. This is the Vive today. So for those who haven't tried it, there's quite a few running on the show. Um, I'll take time, go around, have a look, and try it. Um, it's worth it. The differences with Vive to anything else out there is Vive actually tracks you with base stations, and it allows you to move in any direction you want, no matter where you are. You can walk around like I am now. because I do it in real life. I use my hands. You've got hands. You can walk. You can move. So it's VR that really reflects how you behave in real life. And that's what's special with Vive. Like I say, full presence. And if you see that in some of the activities, actually, so some of the games, I'm not talking about gaming really today, but if you see some of the people, you can jump around, leap around, all directions. It's very, very engaging. And it's a content creator's dream as a result of that. Vive, of course, like I've said, goes way beyond the VR headset. So something we launched earlier this year is actually this little thing here. It's about so big. It's called a Vive Tracker. The Vive Tracker is something you can attach to any object you like to turn it into a VR object. So, so far, we've seen examples of people attaching it to a baseball bat, to a camera, to toy guns for gaming purposes. And I'm going to show you a couple of other examples in a minute. 
but it allows you anything you want to become a VR object, you can turn it into a VR object. This is an example of where it's attached actually to the guy here, to his feet and to his belt. And it allows him to show full presence VR. And it's behaving like it really does in real life. Um, maybe he doesn't quite do that. But it turns him into a true character, which is quite a big deal. If you think of people who've always played the game from the observational perspective, looking at it from outside, to step in and be that, be that first person, it's an enormous thing. So VR is leading a few massive trends. VR is incredibly social. In fact, my biggest learning, and we've been showing VR publicly for over two years now, my biggest learning is just how social it is. We always knew it would be social. We always figured peer-to-peer, VR-to-VR would be very social. It's also strangely social, mainly maybe because it's new, VR headset to non-VR headset. If you walk around the show here and see somebody in a VR headset, there'll be a crowd around them. Everybody's kind of interested. Everybody's engaged. It's still a really exciting thing to be part of. But the really cool part of that is, of course, we all go to our own homes tonight. We put the headset on, and we can enter the same room again. I can give this talk to you guys in VR. You can high five me if it's good. Stick your thumbs down if it's bad. But it allows people to interact remotely, but in a real and meaningful way. Something we've added to allow people to spend longer in VR, by the way, is this. It's a deluxe head strap. So this is something that's coming to market in the next couple of months. It's got integrated audio. It allows you to spend longer in there. What we initially saw when we first brought VR to market a year ago was that a lot of the experiences were pretty short. They're getting longer. They're getting longer and longer over time as meaningful content, content is developed as the gaming side of it becomes longer games that keep you immersed for multiple hours at a time, and the companies using it for serious purposes have actually had the time to create something meaningful, and as a result, can actually use that. There's another accessory that we've been showing a bit. We've showed it a couple of weeks ago at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. We showed it at CES, and it's this thing. So this is TPCast. This does something very special it cuts the cable. So one of the things that people have noticed who've tried high-end VR is, of course, you have a cable from a computer into your headset. Funnily enough, it's not actually been an issue. People develop a sixth sense for where it is. But of course, it's much better if we can cut that cable. So TPCast is a company that we've supported through VIVEX, our accelerator program. It's a small startup. And they've actually developed technology where they can run latency-free, high-quality VR without the cable. It's a massive deal. So I'm showing you an example here, by the way. I mentioned we had a baseball bat a minute ago. There we are. So this is actually our Vive Tracker attached to a baseball bat. This is what a company was showing at CES. And this is fascinating, because they had a lot of data there from all the major leagues of what pitchers do, what the baseball pitchers do. So if you're the Yankees preparing to pay the Red Sox, you can actually go into the VR headset and train against the people you're going to play against with actual data, real time, and a tracked baseball bat, which is pretty awesome. So the tracker allows you a degree of freedom. The head strap makes it more comfortable to stay in there for longer. And the wireless potential there, of course, makes that far easier for the future. So that's kind of where we are with the product. But what does that product allow you to do? And this is a really exciting thing. It allows you to explore. I think. A nice way of summarizing VR, and a few people say this, is it, the beauty of it, it allows you to go where you physically can't in real life. So in the past 12 months, I've stood on the bottom of the ocean. I've stood on top of Everest. I've stood on Mars, actually, as well. And they've all felt real to me. In the moment of doing it, it's all felt absolutely real. And that's incredible. It allows you to create as well. So if anyone's tried tilt brushing VR, for those of you who haven't, by the way, and you want to try one thing in Vive, please go and try Tilt Brush. It's painting, but where all axes are open, painting in three dimensions. The first thing I ever drew in there was a door, and then I walked through it and stood there giggling for two minutes. It's just sensational. Really worth trying. It allows you to connect. It allows you, like I was talking about a minute ago, to socialize with people in different buildings, in different cities, in different parts of the world. 
it allows you to experience. So if you think of it from the side of, for example, the entertainment industry, how they can create that emotional connection with their customers, VR allows them to go that step further. And finally, it actually allows you to shop. Now, I'm going to come to an example about that in a minute, but that's a pretty interesting one, too. Something I've not mentioned so far is education. I don't know what you guys are like in terms of learning, but if one of you was to give me a book today, ask me to read it, and I'd happily read it, but I may remember 10%, possibly less. I'd remember a bit of it. If you actually get me to do something, to do an activity, to be involved in it, I'm going to remember a lot. I'm a very visual learner. I'm a very immersed learner, if you like. I learn by doing. And VR allows you to do that. So I'm going to show you a short video of something. We had some Vive Developer Awards recently. Um, this was one of the winners. And this is education around the Apollo 11 flight mission. So if anyone wants to go into space but hasn't been yet, um, here's a way you can do it. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. If anybody ever doubts the bravery of the people who've been to space, by the way, just spend two minutes sat in VR, taken off in a rocket. It's petrifying. The whole dashboard, everything around you is shaking. You've seen the Earth moving. It is quite a surreal experience. But of course, as an educational thing, if you're engaging with children, or if you're engaging with actually, it's not just children, if you're engaging with adults either as well, it's such a great way of conveying a message. And I've mentioned education in the level of Apollo VR. But actually, education goes a lot further, and it goes actually into the business side as well. So a couple of weeks ago, we were showing something at MWC in Barcelona uh, with a company who were actually teaching people how to weld. Now, if you think welding is a costly thing to learn, it's very hot, it's very dangerous, you need a big safety mask, and you need a lot of equipment. You can get to 90% competence just in VR. It's very difficult, by the way. I was rubbish. Um, <laughs> but it's an amazing thing. And that's just one example. So if you think of any kind of training situation that is complex or difficult to do in real life, doing it in VR is so much easier. So I've, joked, I've shown Apollo 11, of course. But I think it's also worth mentioning there's other types of things coming in VR too. So anyone who's ever dreamt of sitting on the sitting in the crew here, you can do it. Um, that will be coming out. There's already a demo showing of that. So it's quite an amazing experience. And the cool thing here is that the people building content for VR, have we got any content developers in the audience here? Hello. <laughs> um, the people building content, it's really a combination from individuals right through to the world's biggest studios and everything in between. And that's exciting. So let me come back to something I mentioned a minute ago that was retail. Retail is a really interesting thing. You guys have probably seen this, the rise of online shopping, the decline in real shops. How do you connect with your customers? Well, actually, a great way to connect with your customers 
is in the virtual world. Now, this is interesting. If you were to go and buy a coat, I don't have a coat on, so if I was to go and buy a coat, you go in there and you feel it, you physically feel it, it feels soft, it feels expensive, it feels good, you'll pay more for it. And that's proven out by studies. The really interesting thing is, you will also pay more for it if you perceive that you've felt it. You don't even have to physically touch it. So if you think of this from the concept of a retailer, how they can get their story across to people. And we've got an example here with haptic gloves, by the way, that you can track. So you can actually perceive to feel something. All of a sudden, you're not going to take the cheap option, or you're not just going to accept the basics. It's a chance to bring high-end product across to people from the, from the confines of their own home. So it's actually, rather than something that can damage retail, it's a massive opportunity for them. I mentioned training a minute ago in terms of welding, in terms of education. This one here looks kind of fun, and I've just thrown up a fun photo. This is actually very serious. So we've got a Vive tracker on the front of that fire hose there, meaning that fire hose is a tracked object in VR. That jacket he's got on there, by the way, has heated panels in. So when you've got the headset on, you've got a fire hose, and you're putting out a fire, it feels real. You feel the heat on your body. You're learning, actually, how to put out a fire. And this isn't something that's been built for fun. This has actually been built by somebody who puts out fires as part of their business. This is, uh, the man who's done this is, um, works for a university on the one side and is actually a part-time firefighter. So this is solving very serious problems, and it's only one example in VR. It's a massive deal. So I've talked about shopping a bit. But I think it's good to look at it from the, from the position of large businesses. Now, we've got one example here, BMW. Because I could equally sit here and talk about other car companies, whether that's Audi, whether that's others, working around VR. It's a way to connect with customers that you physically cannot do otherwise without them sitting in a showroom. So if you think about it, in terms of when you go into a showroom, you see maybe five cars, but actually a car company has a catalog of 100 because there's all different configurations, different colors, different stylings, different wheels, different seats. You think of the ability to adapt that in a virtual world and how that allows you to connect with a customer. And you think of that from a customer perspective, by the way. I'm sure we've all bought cars in here. I know my car. I bought it without actually seeing the actual color. I was kind of hoping it would be OK. I've got a thing for red cars. Um, but I didn't see it. If I'd have actually been able to see it and to walk around it in virtual reality, that would have made a massive difference. And the buy-in you get there is enormous. And the other thing of that, of course, is the remorse you get. The buyer's remorse is far more limited because you've already engaged with your product. You've already helped to define it. That's an awesome thing. So I want to talk a bit about how do we get content out to people? How do we get content out to end consumers? Gaming, our partner for Vive is Steam. For those of you who don't know Steam, it's the world's leading online PC gaming platform. It's a very obvious route if you want to buy games. But for non-gaming content, we're actually working on something called Viveport. Viveport works across a few different areas. It's actually an umbrella for a bigger picture. So non-gaming content for you at home, whether that's educational, whether that's retail-based, whether that's something else, who knows? The ideas are still flooding in. But we're also supporting the arcade business, and Viveport will be agnostic across platforms, and especially in China, for example, mobile VR is an enormous thing, so we're supporting content for that as well. So one challenge a lot of people have is, wow, there's so much content out there. How can, I, how can I get my head around where to start? If I see 1,000 plus pieces, where do I start? So we're actually doing something called Viveport subscription. What that allows you to do is have access to a curated list of content for a monthly payment. And actually, it means you don't have to pay for individual pieces and download them. So it helps you have a route in there. The other really interesting trend we've seen is arcades. Is anyone here old enough? A few of you are looking around, no offense. 
but old enough to remember arcades from back in the day when you went in there as kids, they were shiny lights, it was mega exciting. I used to love them. Arcades are making a comeback, but in a completely different way. VR is driving the arcades. So with Viveport, there's over 400 titles available in arcades. And these are popping up across Europe, by the way. I know within Germany this year, for example, one company alone are going to set up 20 of them, VR arcades, where you can actually fully engage. If you look at other parts of the world that are leading this trend, in China, there's already over 1,000 arcades that are showing Vive. You think about that, that's amazing. People are actually taking the VR arcade as a destination for their own free time. It is a viable business in its own right. I'm just going to show you a quick video of what it looks like in one of these arcades. And the one striking thing for anybody who ever goes into these kind of experiences, everybody comes out of it. We called it at start the VR grin. Everyone takes off the headset, has this ear-to-ear -ear smile on their face. It's such a captivating experience. So final couple of things before I open up to some questions, because uh, I'm keen to actually see if you guys have anything you want answered. But we are running something called Vive Studios. There's a lot of great content out there developed by third parties, but there's some things we want to push as well. So we've created a few cool games, something called Arcade Saga, Front Defense, where you're actually playing the role of the soldier there, Knockout League. Has anybody ever tried boxing in real life? I haven't. Um, I'm a bit of a wimp. But boxing in a, in a VR environment is actually quite fun. The punches don't hurt, and you're sort of swinging your fists. It's great fun. So here's a few sort of leaving notes I'm going to leave you with. Already today, for Vive, there's over 1,300 games and hundreds of non-gaming apps out there. It is the developer's VR mode of choice. Um, this has been borne out in surveys that we've had over the past months. The cool thing is it's open to all developers from indie small developers through to AAA studios, through to large corporations, and there's a lot of them building for it. The VR ecosystem is growing, so we've enabled the tracker to allow you to put other objects in VR. The store is growing, so the world of VR is really booming. And we're trying to support that content side of it as well. So I just want to throw it open to any questions from you guys. Has anybody got any? Yes. Hey, hey one. <laughs> Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you if you uh, had any news on the next version of HTC Vive. Um, I can't. You can probably guess the answer. <laughs> but I think it's fair to say our main focus at the moment is really the current Vive, because actually the current Vive is still cutting edge. And actually, it's broadening around it, what we can do. So it wouldn't be fair to the developer world, for example, who've created all this awesome content, and to the people who've bought Vive already. So our main focus is on current Vive and making sure that there's more content out there um, and there's a better ecosystem of accessories that they can buy, that they can actually use with the Vive, and really spend more time in there. We're just seeing now some of the best experiences coming online. So I, I can't talk about future generations, but our focus really is on current Vive. Uh, how Vive will, uh, will integrate with live broadcasting, uh, TV or matches or uh, events, conferences? Good question. Um, it's actually a really, we've spoken to a lot of broadcasters over the past year or two, 
and a lot of them are looking at how they can do a combination of monetizing their content, but also make it more immersive. Um, we've seen some early ideas. I guess if we step away from live broadcasting a second, we're seeing a lot of the movie studios, when they're creating a film, for example, they're creating some VR content around it. John Wick's a great example. It launched a couple of weeks ago. There was an awesome Vive experience where you got to sort of stand on a rooftop and get shot. Uh, but um, it was an awesome piece of engagement, though, for the fans of the film. Um, in terms of that becoming live, there's a few challenges, I guess, people need to overcome in terms of making it truly immersive. I think where it's really going to come to the fore in the short to medium term is around events. There's a lot of concert artists, for example, who really want to be showing their concert live in VR. Isn't it much cooler if you can stand next to your superhero on stage and watch them from here rather than watching them from back there or up in row X, Y, Z? In terms of bigger broadcast, I think that's going to happen in the coming year or two when more and more people at home have VR headsets. There's a few basics, though, that need to be learned. I think it's also fair to say. Um, one of the things we have learned in the past couple of years is that if you take the old rules of a medium and put them into VR, you're going to fail, um, if, whether that's in terms of motion, interaction, how you talk to people. VR is a completely different world. And that's actually what's so exciting. Um, there's so much learning to do. But I think there's going to be a lot of steps towards it in the short to medium term. Sorry, long answer, but hope that gives you some input. Anyone else? Fabulous. In which case, I just want to leave you with the note that there's a lot of Vive here on site for those of you who haven't tried it. VR is here, and it's here to stay this time. I think everyone realizes that, because the difference between VR now and VR in its initial boom in the early 90s is that VR is solving real world problems. So I want to thank you for your time. And yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, hands together for Mr. Graham Breen.